Welcome to Speaking of Athletes. I'm Maddie Salamone. I'm a lawyer and athlete advocate. I was also a collegiate lacrosse player and chaired the Division I Student Athlete Advisory Committee to the NCAA, or National SAC, while I was in school. In this episode, we're going to discuss the much-anticipated Supreme Court decision rendered in NCAA v. Alston on Monday, June 21st, 2021, in case you're listening way after the fact. If you are listening to this, you've no doubt heard tons of things swirling around in the media at this point. I've actually heard some lawyers and others declare that this case means that players can be paid, while also conflating the issues of NIL and pay-for-play. So I want to correct some of the information that's been put out there and address some of the things that this case did and what it did not do. I'll also discuss what this means for college sports moving forward. This case was unanimously decided in favor of the athletes, and it is one of the most significant sports law cases in the last 40 years and and, and of all time, really. That said, I want to emphasize that the significance of this decision is largely based on the precedent it has now set for future litigation and the way it eroded arguments upon which the NCAA has relied in court and in crafting its rules for years and years. But to be clear, this decision did not put an immediate end to amateurism, nor did it say that players can be paid. Some of the language in the decision, which I'll address, may very well set the stage for further litigation and other action that will eventually do just that. But as of today, amateurism skates on, definitely on thin ice, and players may not be compensated by their schools, which is what pay-for-play refers to, as opposed to NIL, which involves third parties compensating athletes to use their names, images, and likenesses, and therefore does not implicate things like Title IX, for instance. What this decision did was decide a very narrow issue. And that's because even though both sides appealed the the district court's decision, which was ultimately upheld by the Ninth Circuit, only the NCAA actually appealed the Ninth Circuit's decision to the Supreme Court. And that's why the case name flipped from Alston v. NCAA to NCAA v. Alston at that point. Now, many have called the NCAA's decision to appeal the Ninth Circuit ruling a tactical error because the Ninth Circuit decision was actually far less damaging to the NCAA in future litigation than this decision certainly will be, and and I definitely agree with that. The issue presented to the Supreme Court was whether the NCAA, including its member institutions and conferences, violated antitrust law by agreeing to limit how much athletes can be compensated for education-related expenses. Now, the Supreme Court found that they did, in fact, violate antitrust law and upheld the injunction in so doing that that was issued by the Ninth Circuit, preventing the NCAA from enforcing its offending compensation rules on education-related expenses. Now, the players had originally appealed the district court's decision, arguing that the court should have enjoined all of the NCAA's challenged uh, compensation limits, including those untethered to education, which I have to point out is already a very fine line that requires further definition and which the court actually empowered the NCAA to further define. But ultimately, the Supreme Court did not render a decision on those other compensation rules, which would include things like caps on scholarships and cash awards, because the players did not bring that issue before the court. Now, there is some strong indication that if they had, they would have received a favorable ruling. But there's also language that suggests it might not have been so cut and dried as it has been presented. So really who's to say, and, and future litigation is, is ultimately most likely to determine that. With all of that said, though, an important question remains, which is what constitutes education-related expenses? Uh, 
we know that within that, it includes things like reimbursement for computer costs, study abroad programs, internship opportunities, uh, and scholarships to attend vocational schools, among other things yet to be d defined. The NCAA did try to sell the court and the public on the idea that this injunction would somehow open the door for schools to provide benefits that amounted to pay for play, including things like providing cars to athletes as an educational expense to help them get back and forth to class. But the Supreme Court ultimately didn't buy that argument and pushed back saying, quote, nothing in the lower court's order precluded the NCAA from continuing to fix compensation and benefits unrelated to education. Limits on scholarships, for example, remain untouched, end quote. It in fact gave the NCAA leeway, as the court points out, and the NCAA and its members were free to propose a definition of compensation or benefits that were, quote, related to education. The court goes on to say, quote, nothing stops it from enforcing a no Lamborghini rule. And again, the district court invited the NCAA to specify and later enforce rules delineating which benefits it considers legitimately related to education. To the extent the NCAA believes meaningful ambiguity really exists about the scope of its authority, regarding internships, academic awards, in-kind benefits, or anything else, it has been free to seek clarification from the district court since the court issued its injunction three years ago. And then it goes on to point out that they've only ever sought clarification on one thing in those three years. The injunction does not stop the NCAA from continuing to prohibit compensation from sneaker companies auto dealerships, boosters, or anyone else. And further, the injunction only applied to the NCAA and agreements between multiple conferences. It still allowed individual conferences and schools to, quote, adopt even stricter rules, if they so chose. Because again, the whole issue under antitrust law arises when the schools and conferences act collectively under the umbrella of the NCAA or are otherwise colluding nationwide to fix the prices of these benefits that they provide athletes, because that gives them complete control over the marketplace of college sports. Whereas an individual conference and its schools acting alone would still allow for competition in the marketplace, and that's ultimately what antitrust law is all about. So again, for all of these reasons, the court called this argument by the NCAA an overread of the injunction and referred the NCAA to the district court to present any uh, what they called practically important question it has, um, quote, before conjuring hypothetical concerns in this court, end quote, which I basically read as the courts uh, calling out the NCAA for fear-mongering tactics. But I digress. Uh, the opinion ends by emphasizing the scope of the review by the court and quoting the Ninth Circuit stating, quote, for our part, though we can only agree with the Ninth Circuit, the national debate about amateurism in college sports is important. But our task as appellate judges is not to resolve it, nor could we. Our task is simply to review the district court judgment through the appropriate lens of antitrust law, end quote. I want to point something else out that is very important in this entire discussion. That is that this decision does not compel schools to spend more, actually, on education-related expenses. It simply removes the limitations and gives schools and conferences the discretion to do so. And the idea here is that, you know, there are some schools who can very much afford to spend more on these expenses, as evidenced by the obscene amount going to coaches and facilities, which this opinion definitely points out, um, and which continues to increase each year. And, though, for the schools who can't afford it in the same way or otherwise choose not to, they're not required to do so. So really, the NCAA fighting this is 
it continuing to fight against athletes. All of that said, the reason this is such a significant decision is because of the way it obliterated the NCAA's arguments. And in doing so, set precedent for further litigation that will slowly erode the NCAA's concept of amateurism, which, as this court points out, the district court found that, quote, the NCAA has not adopted any consistent definition, end quote. Now, to break this down even further, this decision also made it clear that all of the NCAA's rules are subject to ordinary rule of reason analysis under antitrust law, meaning they don't get some sort of lesser standard, nor is there a presumption that the NCAA's rules are valid as a matter of law, which they've sort of claimed they have been. Also, while rejecting the NCAA's arguments and calling out the absurdity of many of its claims, the court kind of pulled the rug out from underneath the NCAA by forever eliminating its ability to rely on a 1984 case known as Board of Regents to avoid scrutiny by the courts or escape ordinary rule of reason analysis. Because for decades, the NCAA has relied on the language from this case, which it actually lost, but you wouldn't necessarily know that based on the way that the NCAA talks about this case, just like I kind of anticipate they will talk about the Austin case. Um, but they they used this case to claim that its rules were to be given ample latitude, was the phrase that was in the opinion of this um, 1984 case. And the court has finally definitively held that the language upon which the NCAA has relied is merely dicta, meaning that the language was merely passing commentary on matters not at issue in that case. And therefore, it is not binding nor dispositive in Alston. Additionally, the court stated that, you know, the court simply did not have occasion to declare, nor did it declare, the NCAA's compensation restrictions pro-competitive both in 1984 and forevermore. In other words, the NCAA's rules are not valid as a matter of law, nor, the, nor were they ever deemed to be so, despite what the NCAA has claimed. Additionally, the court makes clear that even if the language in that case were binding, and even if it said what the NCAA claimed it did, college sports has changed dramatically since 1984, including and especially in terms of the amount of money brought in by TV contracts, which was ultimately what the Board of Regents case was about. It didn't involve athletes at all. And therefore, it warrants a fresh look by this court. Now, this would also seem to invalidate the cases that relied on the NCAA's interpretation of this 1984 case to rule in favor of the NCAA. So that'll be interesting as well. Also, I found the NCAA's response to the decision extremely ironic because it was quick to dismiss Justice Kavanaugh's concurrence as immaterial and supposedly not an indication of what the rest of the court thinks, which, by the way, it couldn't possibly know because there was no further concurrence in this unanimous decision. The reason it's ironic, though, is because in addition to the ample latitude line that the NCAA has clung to for years from Board of Regents, They've also clung to language in the dissent by Justice White in that same case, which stated that the NCAA's fundamental charge is to, quote, maintain intercollegiate athletics as an integral part of the educational program and the athlete as an integral part of the student body, end quote. So this really just amounts to more of the NCAA spinning whatever it can in whatever way it benefits the most. Anyway, Justice Kavanaugh's concurrence has been given a lot of attention and with good reason. But there is some additional language in both his concurrence and in the opinion by Justice Gorsuch 
that I think deserves a little more attention than it has been given. And that's because while the opinion signals that the court is not buying the NCAA's arguments, it also acknowledges other considerations that will need to be taken with respect to deciding on the other compensation rules. Uh, And that is those that are not tethered to education. And it's worth mentioning because as critical as Kavanaugh's concurrence was, including the last paragraph that has gotten a lot of airtime, um, where he states, quote, nowhere else in America can businesses get away with agreeing not to pay workers a fair market rate on the theory that their product is defined by not paying their workers a fair market rate. And under ordinary principles of antitrust law, It is not evident why college sports would be any different. The NCAA is not above the law, end quote. He also says that, quote, the NCAA's business model of using unpaid student athletes to generate billions of dollars in revenue for the college for the colleges raises serious questions under antitrust law, end quote. He additionally blasted the NCAA's attempt to avoid the consequences of price fixing by defining its product as one that uses price-fixed labor, that is, unpaid athletes. In fact, Justice Gorsuch's opinion also said that a party cannot, quote, relabel a restraint as a product feature and declare it immune from Section 1 scrutiny, uh, in other words, antitrust scrutiny. And Kavanaugh also said, quote, the NCAA couches its arguments for not paying student athletes in innocuous labels, but the labels cannot disguise the reality. The NCAA's business model would be flatly illegal in almost any industry in America, end quote. And he, he just continues to throw in line after line. Um, and But one of my favorite, personally, um, is where he says, quote, law firms cannot conspire to cabin lawyers' salaries in the name of providing legal services out of a love of the law, end quote. Um, Obviously getting at what the NCAA has claimed and schools have that players play for the love of the game and that's why they don't need any of the benefits and, and that it would destroy college sports if they did because somehow that would mean that they weren't playing for the love of the game. Uh, Anyway, basically, his concurrence calls BS on virtually every argument the NCAA made. And I won't hit every single one. I mean, they're they're really, he just, he went after them uh, in ways that just absolutely obliterate any claims that they don't make money um, and that, you know, and, and all these cries of being poor and virtually every argument, again, that the NCAA has made. Suffice it to say, it does indeed signal big trouble for the NCAA in future litigation. At the same time, while this very much suggests that the court may in the future endorse athletes receiving some sort of actual salary to play their sports, a paragraph that has not received enough attention is the one two paragraphs above the line where he says the NCAA is not above the law. And that's where Kavanaugh acknowledges the more difficult questions that would need to be addressed at the point that the NCAA's remaining compensation rules come before the court. He stated, quote, if it turns out that some or all of the NCAA's remaining compensation rules violate the antitrust laws, some difficult policy and practical questions would undoubtedly ensue. Among them... How would paying greater compensation to student-athletes affect non-revenue-raising sports? Could student-athletes in some sports but not others receive compensation? How would any compensation regime comply with Title IX? If paying student-athletes requires something like a salary cap in some sports in order to preserve competitive balance, how would that cap be administered? And given that there are now... 180,000 Division I student-athletes, what is a financially sustainable way of fairly compensating some or all of those student-athletes? And those, I mean, those are all very legitimate questions that when the issue of, of 
you know, payment coming from the schools comes into play, you know, th- those are those are issues that need to be addressed. Um, and he goes on to make another point uh, that is important to mention because it was alluded to in both the opinion and in his concurrence. And that is that there are two ways for this antitrust analysis to potentially come out differently in the future. Uh, One would be Congress would have to change the law or otherwise grant an exemption, which the court made clear it would not do from the bench, um, because this decision is based on antitrust law as it exists currently, and all the court can do is interpret the law. Alternatively, the athletes could engage in some sort of collective bargaining or seek some other negotiated agreement to provide them with a fairer share of the revenue, which is similar to what is done in other professional leagues and and also the reason that price fixing is allowed under those circumstances because the athletes have an opportunity to collectively bargain for their, you know, for their those rights. And both of those things have been discussed uh, with the NCAA lobbying Congress for some sort of antitrust exemption, which is something that was further debated during the recent congressional hearings, uh, which I also covered on other episodes. Additionally, the idea of some sort of collective bargaining for athletes has been discussed for years. Uh, and while I think there is a tremendous need for some sort of independent body to advocate on behalf of players, uh, when it comes to all sorts of things within the NCAA, including rules and benefits. I also acknowledge, though, that there are some major challenges with having one body to represent all athletes in all sports. And even within the NCAA, there are separate committees that create sports-specific rules because they differ in some important ways, including with their recruiting calendars and, and all sorts of other very sports-specific issues. And this is one particular area um, where I have racked my brain to try and come up with a workable solution that that really makes sense. And I I have not quite gotten there Um, because I'm also all too aware of the issues that uh, I I experienced trying to represent all athletes on SAC um, across all sports and conferences. And it's, it's extremely difficult. Um, and again, I, I, I have not been able to conceptualize a way that it can be done adequately and fairly to all athletes. So I'm eager to hear from anyone who thinks that they may have the solution for that issue. Cause I, I, you know, I would, again, I'd love to hear it. Um, but anyway, to tie this all together, this has certainly put the NCAA in a far weaker position moving forward, despite how they have tried to spin it. As expected, this decision is also an indication that the NCAA will have to make sure that its rules are not running afoul of antitrust law. And we may start to see more uh, legislation being determined by the conferences rather than the NCAA at large, because that would at least allow for greater competition between the conferences and help avoid the issue of schools colluding to fix prices across the entire marketplace. And that will also have the effect of giving athletes more choices, and hopefully that will drive schools to compete to make things more fair for athletes, or at least we can hope. Um, though, I mean, that, that very much remains to be seen, and I, I certainly remain skeptical having seen you know how, how the NCAA operates. But a, a comment about litigation as a force for change, um, because, again, I, I think I've talked a lot about how this – case really sets the stage for further litigation. Um, But I I have to say, it deeply bothers me as a former athlete that one of the top expenses of the NCAA each year continues to be spending on outside counsel to fight against athletes. And in this case alone, which, which spanned over the better part of a decade, there are hundreds of millions of dollars in legal expenses. And I want you to really think about that. I mean, that is, it's it's really sickening um, when you think about all of the ways that that could really help benefit athletes. And so in some ways, I kind of hate to see 
a case that is now opening up more litigation, which means more legal battles and more fees going to attorneys and not to the athletes. And I, I just think that there are far more efficient ways to find solutions to these issues rather than dragging out additional legal battles for another decade, potentially, and possibly delaying positive changes for athletes for just as long. That's also why um, we're unlikely at this point to see NIL rules coming from the NCAA. Rather, it seems like the schools and the conferences will be crafting their own. Uh, and that's based on some of the communications that have happened between um, those members and uh, what you know the NCAA has come out with, what Mark Emmert has has talked about. Um, and you know, and I think they'll they'll likely pull language from state laws. Um, but again, these are all solutions that could have been initiated way earlier than just days before. Um, you know, state laws are going to go into effect um, in certain states. Moving forward, I think we can also expect to see the NCAA trying to establish some definition for education-related benefits, as we mentioned. Uh, I think we'll also start to see conferences do the same. I don't think this will immediately translate into massive changes on the side of education-related expenses, but we could see some schools starting to offer certain benefits um, and jump ahead of their competition. But again, the decision did provide some guidance on some of the constraints where that's concerned. And many of the things mentioned are benefits that schools already offer to some degree, uh, just with certain limitations. I think we'll also see the NCAA Definitely doubling down on its efforts to paint this as a win for them, even though it very much was not, um, in much the same way as they have with with other litigation that they've lost. Um, and we'll we'll see more pressure being placed on Congress, I think, um, by the NCAA to push for some sort of immunity from antitrust, which would then be the law. Like if if. If Congress actually does does do that, um, that would be the law that the court would have to apply in the future, which was brought up in the decision. So again, while this is not a good sign for the NCAA moving forward, um, you know, I, I never really count them out. They've still got a few tricks up their sleeves, and I wouldn't underestimate the lengths that they're willing to go to cling on to their power and control over college sports. So. We will, of course, continue to provide updates as all of this develops. I definitely, again, I want to reemphasize this is definitely a win for athletes. And, you know, it will be interesting to see what develops moving forward. Um, in the meantime, if you found this episode valuable, feel free to give this podcast five stars. Additionally, if you're interested in supporting the podcast, there's a link in the show notes. And it is much appreciated. Also, feel free to follow me on Twitter at MadSal15. And until next time.